Okay. Um, good morning from Washington, D.C. in the United States. I am Hunter Groninger, and I'm really excited to be here to facilitate today's presentations and discussions. I'm a palliative care physician in Washington, D.C. Um, and today we have, a, a, I think, a, a special day to discuss some what I think are very, very important issues in good holistic palliative care, spirituality and psychosocial distress, assessing and managing um, these important aspects of suffering and living with advanced illness. We have a presentation that will start shortly by Dr. Jesse Humphreys. Um, I'll let her introduce herself and then um, we'll have some discussion and then we'll have a case presentation by uh, Ann Kellerman. I'll also let her introduce herself and then we'll have some more discussion after that. I'm really glad that you all are here. Uh, this is such important information and content to be learning about and it's really exciting um, to, to see your enthusiasm and your participation. So thank you for being here. And with that, I will, um, uh, oh, a couple of other just quick housekeeping things. Um, if you have, uh, I'll leave it up to each presenter to kind of determine how um, she would like people to interact, but in general, um, please be sure that you are muted while the presentation is happening. Um, if you have a question or a comment, um, you certainly can, you can raise your hand on the, on the Zoom um, function. Um, or you could come off mute to ask a question, or you can put a question or comment in the chat. We'll keep an eye on that as well to make sure that if you feel more comfortable typing a question or a comment into the chat that we're able to get to those as well. So feel free to participate. We really want this to be interactive. Um, but if you're just kind of listening and absorbing, please be sure you're on mute just so everybody can hear everything. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Humphreys. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Hunter. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, 6 a.m. today in for me in San Francisco, California, where I work uh, as well as a palliative care physician here at uh, University of California, San Francisco, um, and also down in LA. Actually, I do a little bit of work all over California, but I'm really glad to be with you today and completely agree it's a really important topic. I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen. Um, Oh, I think, uh, Hunter, you may have, it says disabled screen sharing. I don't know if I just need to be made a host as well. I, I actually just tried sharing it work before. Sure. Let me see if I can. It says you're the co-host. You want to try again? Now? There we go. Okay, let's see. Great. There you go. Wonderful. Um, and also agree, absolutely, uh, keep yourself muted, but please do use the chat. Feel free to chat in questions there. And um, Dr. Hunter can stop me and ask them if, uh, if there's an appropriate time or I'll, I'll uh, respond to them if I see them as well. So today we'll be talking about spirituality and grief, bereavement, psychosocial support uh, and care for patients. Just to kind of, you know, do a high level view of kind of where we've come from and where we're going. We've talked a lot about all these different elements, right? A lot of pain and symptom control. We've talked a little bit about trauma. We've talked a little bit about psychosocial support. Um, and today we're gonna really dig into some other aspects that are really core and critical for um, basic palliative care. And that's really psychosocial and spiritual support for the patient and the family. And I don't know about everyone, but when I started my medical training, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, you know, we talked about the social history that you could take of patients, right? And I really love this, this comment here by Mark Lewis that I'm, I'm really tired of learning the social history by reading people's obituaries. Um, and I think we really called into question, what exactly are we asking people during the social history? And is this really just a checkbox list of people's risk factors? And how are we actually getting at who a person is as a person? Because um, I think I used to think about it, just making sure you get tobacco history and um, a couple other basic things. But are we really actually fully understanding who this individual human is in front of us who we're taking care of? Um, I think a lot of psychosocial assessment is really is, is something that we kind of think about, but maybe don't necessarily define a little bit. So today we want to think about some of the elements that might go into 
how to try to get to know our patients as full humans. Um, I think that sounds great to say get to know people, but what exactly might be in that and, and why might it be really important to know these aspects to be able to give the best care to people? So I think ultimately, you know, we don't know a ton about, people don't know exactly what goes into assessments, um, but I suspect a lot of you guys already intuit this. You already think about these sorts of things. Um, some of the things that we often think about that might be missing in some studies when we've, we've done these studies are how people actually function. So that's a, that's a really important element, as you guys do know, in the home, how they're functioning their world, how they're functioning in their work, how they're functioning their families. Um, preferences, for sure. I know we've had some communication talks and training, but preferences for their types of treatment and care, just their awareness. So understanding of the disease, their awareness of diagnosis, maybe of their prognosis, if that's been shared, um, or their expectation. Lots of people have a sense about where things are, their expectation for the future, whether it may be aligned with what the medical community believes or not. Um, their own communication style preferences and also their health literacy, but also their cultural values and spiritual um, and religious beliefs as well that we'll get into. One of the things I think um, I, I've been doing a lot more of recently is thinking about um, legacy work and dignity therapy and and the, the concept of this is really, how do I get to know a person as a human? How do I get to know a patient as a human? And how do I blur some of those lines between me as sort of this, this physician and you as this patient and all, and all this sort of hierarchical power differential? How do we actually just sit with people um, and be present with people? And there's this wonderful question that really has been designed as sort of, if you ask one question, so this is, a, this is an excellent take home point. If you take home one question, um, this would be a great one to put in your toolbox. And the patient in the question is, what do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? And I, I find myself actually asking this quite a lot. Um, uh, and, and this is something you can absolutely ask to surrogates as well, to family members, to friends. What do I need to know about your brother to be able to give him the best care? And I think, what do I need to know about him as a person, as a, as a human? Um, and sometimes, you know, that, that may or may not resonate as all these questions, sometimes they resonate with people, sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes you ask them and it worked perfectly with the last person and it just doesn't work for this family, this person. And I would say, you know, uh, take heart, it's okay, that happens, try other questions. So another one that I've loved as well is what brings you joy um, or even just tell me a little bit about yourself as a person. I often find that uh, patients might go into sort of telling their medical history and I have to redirect them to say, that's great, I understand all that, um, or I've heard that, or let's absolutely talk about that if we haven't yet. But I'd love to hear first about kind of who you are as a person. A portion of thinking about these assessments is really thinking about the concept of total suffering or total pain, um, that there's really a lot more elements going into people's experience of the world and their experience of their illness um, and their disease or, um, or their family's experience of those things. And you know, we've sort of mentioned some of these concepts as well, but just to remind us all that Certainly, it's important to think about the physical um, suffering, physical pain, nausea, symptoms, but there's so many different elements of suffering in people's lives and people's communities that may be, first of all, impacting their physical pain. So oftentimes when I'm looking and taking care of a patient and thinking about their pain medications, I'm also thinking about how much is guilt about this impacting the pain? You know, how much is their own pre-existing anxiety and depression impacting this? How much is their distress about being a burden on their family, their distress about the change of their role and no longer being able to provide financially for their family, whatever it may be. Those things come together to really create um, to really create people's suffering. And it's a, it's really a, an error to think that really pain um, and physical pain is the only thing that's impacting people, even when that's all they're sharing. There's been much writing about this sort of of late, but um, this is one particular paper that that addressed it. Um, I think in in a lot of ways, palliative care sort of came into the field, and some of the message early on was, you know, we can treat your pain, you know, we can make you feel better, we can fix some of your suffering, and that is certainly true in many cases. And many pieces of suffering we can certainly make better or impact. And I think especially pain is one of those things that we have a lot of power now, as long as we're getting access to medications, which we know is always a huge struggle. Um, but the reality is that we don't always have the medications we need um, in many situations. And the reality is that we don't always have um, 
all the uh, ability to treat things that are present in people's dying process or people's end of life process. And the reality is also that there is some intrinsic suffering in the end of life. There are some things we can't get away from that are causing suffering. Um, that may be the anxiety of just dying. It may be loss. There are all sorts of griefs um, related to the dying process that they don't have anything to do with dying. You know, the loss of people's role as a parent, the loss of people's role in their family, um, as I mentioned, feeling like a burden, the worry for people you're leaving behind, um, guilt, loneliness. And there's now a lot more thought about, well, what piece of our role in palliative medicine is certainly thinking about how we treat these things, certainly thinking about our medications, but what, what role do we have as well to do something that I think is even harder, which is to sit with suffering, to be present with suffering, to be present sometimes without the ability to change or to be present sometimes without the, you know, stated, um, you know, need to tell patients it will be fine or this will get better. Some things will not be fine. Some things will not get better. You know, there is no sentence in the world that I can tell to a young mother who's leaving her children, it will be fine, you know, that that will not be painful. That will be painful. And there's no, there's no medication in the world for that. And I, I actually find that that's one of the hardest things in medicine to do is to just sit with that and to feel that ourselves, that I don't have a medication for that. And that you know, I don't have a medication for that, but to be able to sit and recognize someone's suffering and to honor it um, and to normalize it, to say, this is, this is hard this is hard and there's no fix for it, but I'm here. I, I will be here with you through that. That is, in some ways, that's actually what medicine used to be, right? Back in the day, you know, many, many long time ago, we didn't really have a lot of interventions. I think a lot of what it was to be a medical provider was to sit with suffering. That was the sort of the core job. We've now gained all these other interventions and medications. And, and I think in some ways, a lot of what palliative medicine I hope is doing is going back to thinking about what are those core elements we may have started with potentially centuries ago. So I think to think about one narrative as we're moving through this, um, a 45 year old woman with metastatic ovarian cancer coming into the hospital with a bowel obstruction, we know that her time may be short, maybe days to weeks, we might have two young children and nurses is reporting that she's, she's crying a lot and she's worried about her children. So I'm wondering now if you guys wanna pull up the chat um, and type in here some thoughts about some of the things that might be causing her suffering. What types of suffering may she be experiencing? I'm seeing fear of loss, worry for her children's care. Absolutely, thinking about the future, thinking about what will happen to her family. dying while her children are so young. Yeah, the loss of just not being there for moments, moments when they're older, how will they manage without her? The, the true fear of what their lives will look like after. Emotional, absolutely. A lot of, a lot of emotions there, a lot of grief, a lot of loss. I think you guys already highlighted a lot of the sufferings that we can imagine that she's suffering, right? We can we can sort of put ourselves to some extent in, in people's positions. And yet there are also things that we cannot imagine. We cannot necessarily predict how some things will be impacting people or what other things might be on their mind that we never would have imagined. Um, so some of the things we want to talk about today are just really some ways to think about assessments, both spiritual assessments we'll get to later and also psychosocial assessments. And this is really to give you a toolbox of questions, right? These are a lot of these talks around communication and assessments. It's a great toolbox to be able to say, I'm going in to see a patient. I don't know exactly what to say or how to get this information. And just to have a couple questions to run through, a couple things to see, to see what happens, to see what comes up with that. Doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do all the aspects for every patient all the time, but it's great to have these things to pull through pull from. Um, some things that I think are really helpful in an assessment of people's psychosocial existence in their in their world is what helps you cope certainly things like we've already talked about communication training what are you hoping for what are you worried about um, but how are your spirits um, this is actually one of my questions screening that I use in most of my visits I often ask even if I'm there for a completely unrelated topic 
um, I might also just check in quickly about people's spirits. It can really, it can really give you in a moment kind of a feeling of where things are for people, what brings you joy. Um, and in doing this and assessing people's presence and in, in, in figuring out sort of how much psychosocial um, support they have, it's also important to think about how we can psychologically support patients as well. Um, and a part of uh, a part of the way that we communicate is really just our presence, uh, our non-judgmental presence, saying a lot of validating things. So not not seeking to fix things, not seeking to tell people, um, I know how you feel, or the way that you feel, you know, get um, better, but saying, I can't imagine how hard well, this is. Um, and also saying, yeah, this is well, common. Well, go ahead and mute yourself if you are, um, if you're just joining us, thanks so much. Um, it's well, common to well, feel, well, it's really normal to feel this. You know, this is something that's really felt by many people who are suffering with serious illness. I think that's really helpful to normalize the way that people are feeling. Certainly important also to manage physical symptoms. I think just as much as spiritual suffering, existential suffering, psychological distress, social distress impacts pain, pain also impacts all those things too, right? So it's highly important. It's really challenging to do any emotional processing and in particular decision-making. So making big decisions and, and having critical communication, incredibly hard to do that when you're having physical pain as well. Um, and, and also really trying to figure out what strengths have people drawn from in the past. I think sometimes you're trying to recreate the wheel, especially with regards to people's um, well that they're pulling from for psychosocial support. And actually what we wanna do is try to figure out how to tap into what has already been useful for them before, whether that's community, whether that's spiritual leaders, whether that's their family support, um, or whether that's their own internal you know, strengths and reserves that they've used. I think often case, the family is really the unit of care. So thinking about that and thinking about how illness really impacts family and friends and how it impacts the rest of their world, right? Finances, you know how incredibly expensive medical care can be, but we also know about how people can lose their relationship to income, um, how they lose the ability to send people to school um, and how caregiving really changes people's roles in a family. And families often need a number of different things, right? We talked already in communication talks about information, how we might wanna check in with people about how they want to hear information. Uh, one skill that I think is really useful to use when you're thinking about, when you have a question to ask someone and you're really not sure kind of how to phrase that question, maybe it would be, you're trying to get it, you know, whether they want another prognosis. Um, I often try to use the some people framing. So, you know, how do you wanna hear information or, um, you know, how do you like to hear news about your disease? Some people who are really sick want to know how much time is left. Other people don't want to talk about that. What do you think? So really framing, and I often try to give, you know, two examples, um, short, you know, without jargon and without judgment. So really trying to let people know, and this also really helps normalize if they were feeling like they really couldn't ask about that to say, I have patients who think this, I have patients who think this, I have patients who really feel like this is right for them and I have patients who feel this is right for them. What do you think? Thinking a lot, I think this, this will talk, thinking a lot about it, the emotional support will get a little bit into grief and bereavement as well. Um, and then just the practical support as well, which I know we've talked a lot before. A brief comment on some medications are, are useful to highlight here, and you guys can go back and reference this as well, but certainly depression is something we you know is very common in our population, common in general population, but also common in particular in our population. Um, and depression really being marked by persistent low mood and um, feelings of inability to feel joy about things. Um, some medications here uh, that we can think about, you can think about if people have um, a long enough time we expect to live that they might get benefit from it. And then for anxiety as well, thinking about both the non-medication uh, techniques. I know we did over a little bit of that in, in the last talk I did a relaxation exercise, um, but uh, those are wonderful um, to think about for patients. And also sometimes medication is absolutely needed. Um, and especially at the end of life, um, you might switch to some other medications that are more sedating like benzodiazepines. And a brief note um, that it's also really important to think, we think about depression, I think more and more in palliative medicine, but there's really this also really important concept of demoralization, which is, which is important to think about because it's different. Um, and both can look the same, you know, both can look like people are very sad, um, are very heavied by what they're going through. 
Um, and depression certainly has, you know, as you can see over here, a lot of clinical, it's a clinical diagnosis, it's got these clinical um, sort of check boxes of thinking about uh, not to persist and feeling a lot of other elements, potentially guilt. Um, and uh, demoralization is not dissimilar sometimes in how it can appear, but it is dissimilar in that it often does not necessarily respond to medications quite as well. And it really is situational. So with people having a really you know, challenging response to, and, and maybe a lack of motivation to really the overwhelm of their real situation being a very reasonable way to respond. Um, but that, but that making it very challenging for them to ultimately have, um, have a positive outlook on things. But oftentimes if you change the situation, you can change demoralization and change people's way of feeling. Um, depression is often harder and often does need medication. move on a little bit to some spiritual dis distress. And, and I think we think of this often as religious, but I wanted to find it much broader um, because I think spiritual distress is really different for different people. Um, and um, for some people, it's, it can be religious distress as well, but for many people it's not, um, or it can be religious and encompassing other things. But I often think of it very simply as, you know, do you feel at peace? Do you feel a well-being in your life? Um, do you have a sense of meaning, a sense of hope, purpose? peace. Um, people use different words for it. So sometimes you have to find the language for the individual person. Um, and this particular distress, as we mentioned, also really goes into that concept of total suffering. One assessment we wanted to really highlight uh, that can be useful, um, because I think, again, this is one of these things that you can go in and really struggle to, to know sort of exactly where am, I, where am I starting here? How do I get some of this information? So the hope assessment has been one that's been really, really helpful for lots of people. And kind of running through this, the first H stands for hope. So what gives you hope? Um, what gives you meaning? What gives you comfort, strength? I often say things like, when times have been hard in the past, um, what has given you hope? Or what has given you comfort? And that can really help people try to figure out what resources they pulled from in the past. That's really helpful. Um, but that can help you identify too. Well, how do we tap into more of that too? It's certainly important to ask, are you part of an organized religion? It's a religion that um, provides you a lot of support because that might be a community. Those might be spiritual leaders that also could be really helpful in caring for patients. Uh, do you have spiritual practices which help you? Which again, could be, could be faith-based, but may not be as well. And then how might, how might this belief um, system or your you know, spiritual worldview, how might that affect um, medical care? How might that affect your preferences for things? How might that affect um, what feels important right now? Um, that's a, a kind of important element for us to think about too, as practitioners to really, again, be incorporating in a person's whole person. One of things to really think about when we're providing spiritual support is to try to sit back um, and listen to a person's short story and show compassion, but without answers. So this is one of those other big take home points if you take another thing back from this lecture is as much as possible, and this is one of the hardest things to do when we are providers who like fixing things, right? We like providing answers. We like telling people it will be fine. We like saying in palliative medicine, we're here to help make you feel better. You know, I often say, oh, you know, we'll, We'll, we'll be doing this stuff and you, you will feel better. You will have less, whatever. And maybe that's the case, uh, but maybe it may not be the case, right? Maybe our role may be a little bit more of that sitting with suffering. And then also very, very importantly in spiritual support, really specifically not trying to apply our own beliefs. So it may be the fact that we feel very much that they're going to see their children in heaven. That may not be something that they feel. Or it may be something that they're really worried about or having lots of guilt around. because they feel like they're questioning God right now, they're questioning their own beliefs. And for us to sort of say, don't worry, you know, you know you'll see them in heaven or, or it will be okay, sort of just doesn't acknowledge all of that internal suffering you're having or that internal, um, you know, guilt or whatever the feelings are. We really want to, to honor where they are and allow them to be wherever that may be. Prompts instead, like, tell me more about this or what does this feel about to you are gonna be much more helpful. And then I think really thinking about how do we get people supported by their community, by their family, friends, by their activities. Um, 
I want to say a brief mention of grief. You guys have probably heard and talked about that there's sort of different different periods of um, of experience that people might go through in grief. Often people talk about the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and the acceptance. And I think oftentimes people think of it as a cycle or a line, you know, that you move through each one of these in a very organized fashion at a right time. Um, you go through each one and then you finally reach acceptance. The reality is that that is not how grief works, you know, for some people potentially, but that is not the norm that there's this sort of first you do this and then you do this. The reality behind grief is that it can be so many different things and it's really important um, for us as providers to acknowledge the incredible variety of grief. And I think also very important for us to acknowledge that people are having grief and losses before they have, um, before they've even gone through a lot of things, right? People grieve through things, people anticipate the loss of dying and leaving their children, they anticipate the loss of going through challenging illness. So just to say there's no one right way to grieve, there's no path that's sort of the path. Um, people might seem like they have acceptance and later become really angry and then when we thought they understood a lot of things really feel like we're perceiving denial um and grief may hit people also many months and many years after someone has left them as well our job is not to fix it our job is to really walk with people through this so in summary um really just important elements to think about when doing a full palliative care assessment and an intervention plan, right? Thinking about people's psychological distress, certainly treating depression, anxiety, they're really common, um, but also really thinking about how we, we integrate the families as we as we have been talking about over and over again around information and um, practical and emotional interventions. Uh, and then really thinking about spiritual distress, distress is one of those prongs that's really impacting people's experience. Uh, and then really one of the main take-homes I want you to, to hold a little bit there's no one way to grieve. And then a piece of our job in palliative medicine, and maybe the hardest piece um, is to sometimes sit, sometimes sit with the suffering and walk with our patients without seeking to fix or without the ability to fix sometimes. So I will pause there. And I'll open up first if there's any um, questions, but Hunter, if you have any specific prompts or goals for us to chat about, very open to it. Uh, no, I think, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jesse. I think yeah, we have some time for sort of some open, open questions and discussions. Um, and I wonder if we have a large group. So if, if people want to either come off mute and just ask verbally, or um, maybe more commonly, people would like to put a question or a comment in the chat. Um, I think we could go ahead and start there. That's a, Dr. Jesse, that's a lot to really think about and, and thank you for that pretty comprehensive presentation. I was thinking a little bit about the slide you had a few slides ago about how we want for the process of grieving to be straightforward and maybe even linear, moving from one step to the next, and how complicated and complex it can be for each individual. Maybe I wonder, just to, just to prompt the group to think a little bit, um, if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and share them, but maybe I wonder if someone has um, a particular story to share about um, an encounter with a patient or with a family member when you were really learning about the role of their of that person's spirituality or religious practice um, and how that impacted their illness experience. I'd be interested to hear what, what people have to say there, but it can be anything. So. I'm seeing a question here uh, to repeat the last point of the hope questions. I am happy to briefly share that again. Okay. 
you were, I think you're maybe looking for the E, the effect on medical care and treatment. So how how might someone's spiritual beliefs and and uh, religious beliefs really impact impact their their goals, impact their wishes, um, impact their um, views views of of medicine? There's a there's a great study um, that was done a little while ago that asked the question. Um, what percentage of patients really just rely, primarily rely on the medical, you know, maybe the, the doctors and the nurses sharing the prognosis, sharing the information about the disease, really sort of just sit and say, okay, I, he I heard what you said. And sort of that, that's my understanding of my disease is really coming from you guys from that, as opposed to coming from other things in their life. And the percentage, I believe, of, of people who like really just listen to the medical um, individuals to come up with their understanding of the disease was like 2%. The reality is that people listen absolutely to medical professionals about what their, where the disease is and how much time they have left. And also they think about all sorts of things. They think about other people in their lives who've been ill in the past um, and their experiences of cancer, of treatment, you know, well, I had a brother and he went through this. Um, and they also think about their beliefs about faith, potentially, um, their beliefs about um, what faith can do to their own healing process. And all of those things come together to inform their understanding of, of where their illness is and of what they should do. It helps actually make, make decisions for them. Um, so it's just an important thing for us to think about. And sometimes when we're confused about people's actions, it's because we're missing that there's all these other things in their lives that they're, that they're really using um, to understand where they are and to help them make decisions. Thanks. There are a couple of great um, questions in the chat. I just wanted to raise your awareness to Dr. Jesse. The first one I'll read out is, um, thank you for the presentation. Can you please speak more to the power of sitting silently, not having to fill the space with talk? How did you personally become comfortable with silence? Oh, that is a great, that is a great and hard question. Um, and I'd say for me that it has certainly progressed over time. I think, you know, you guys can tell that I, I talk quickly and I have an animated sort of a potentially pressured way of, of interacting. And, and I'd say that that's often true with patients too, because that's who I am and, and how I am with patients. And as I've gone on in my practice, I think I, I say less and less. Um, I sit a little bit more with silence, um, and I think this practice of sitting with suffering is one that I have really, you know, taken on more and more over the, the last years, in part because I have been increasingly humbled at my own inability to cure suffering. You know, I think the more that I see patients, um, and I am in situations where I may not have the tools, I may not know of any tools, to be able to do something to fix someone's suffering, but I may just also not have tools that I know of in another setting. And that's common everywhere. You know, that's common in every setting that there are tools that I might have in some other place. You know, I might, I might be in a place that I have access to tons of medications, but I just don't have the spiritual support. You know, I don't have the spiritual leader that I really want that I feel like that's really going to impact someone's suffering here. Um, and I think I'm just more and more humbled uh, at my role is is important, but it is not everything. You know, and people people were dying long before I started practicing medicine, um, and people will will die long after I am gone. Um, and people have been finding their own ways of of going through this um, since the beginning of time, and and more and more that I find that sitting and saying often I try to really say this is. This sounds so hard, I, I can't imagine what it's like to feel this, to be going through this. And I just want you to know that I'll be walking with you. I'll be walking with you every step of the way. And sometimes I'm saying that just as much for me as someone else, you know, I might be overwhelmed by someone suffering as well. Um, but to say, I don't know all the answers, but I do know that I can tell you I'll be here. And I think that in and of itself is actually a huge intervention, not to say that it fixes it, it's not trying to fix the problem, but I think that's a, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And I think I've been humbled as well as I've seen, especially becoming a parent myself, a couple of, yeah, I have two, two young boys now, um, but becoming a parent and actually seeing um, parents lose children and seeing children lose parents, that type of suffering I think has been 
sometimes so hard and unbearable for me to see. And so that has been humbling as well, because I truly do not know that there's a way that I have to solve those sufferings, um, but I can sit with it. Thanks. I actually might just take a moment and uh, see if other faculty um, want to weigh in on that as well. Aaron, Anne, Anna, Dr. Megan, don't have to, but if there's any other, just to get some different perspectives. Yeah, I was also thinking in relation to the silence, the way that a, like, I guess, in a sense, we as medical professionals are strangers to our patients, right? We meet them uh, in a very short amount of time, have a very strong relationship with them. So the type of silence we can offer them, I mean, even just practically is short. So you would maybe offer uh, a few minutes of silence with patients, or if you're sitting at the bedside and it seems like a time where you can spend 10 to 15 minutes um, and moments of silence in your conversation happen. I think one thing in, in every culture is that medical professionals are respected. So if your nurse or your doctor or even the chaplain is sitting at the bedside and offering silence, it also shows the family that silence is okay and friends uh, that are coming to visit that silence is all right. Because I think many times when you have extended family or friends or neighbors come, they always want to say something. And sometimes it's not always appropriate for people to be saying things or they don't really know, they're just saying something just to be heard in that sense. So if we as medical professionals show families that it's, there's not necessarily always going to be an answer or it's okay to take a pause and not be speaking the whole time, that also allows them to realize that they don't necessarily need to answer every single question the patient is having. Sometimes questions that patients ask, some, of course there are many times questions need to be answered, but sometimes there are questions that don't always have an answer. So, so it also allows the people that are visiting to, to, to practice that silence as well. As we, as we show it, then they also hopefully will, will do that. And I think that does provide people with comfort. Um, uh, being honest and truthful with difficult questions is really important, not ignoring a question with silence, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, change directions a little bit and uh, call attention to another question that came up. Um, what will the palliative care team do if symptoms of the patient are getting worse? Maybe you start with you, Dr. Jesse. Yeah, no, that's a really important um, element, especially I think if you're doing some of these, certainly do, you know, do these assessments, and, you know, as the first one, think about kind of, think about psychosocial support and, and, and issues, think about existential suffering and spiritual suffering. Oftentimes those are a piece of why physical symptoms are, are reported to be getting worse for sure. Um, but certainly if symptoms are getting worse, despite sort of doing those assessments and doing things, one, do them again, um, but also think about broadly. So kind of go back to all of our other talks we've thought about, right? Like think about physical issues, think about worsening and progression disease, think about all the, um, the physical medicine reasons that we might have worsening symptoms. Um, but I think, again, think about these things, think about something changed in um, their support system. Think about some family member came and said that they weren't gonna be there for their children the way they thought they were. Think about um, them really feeling like they're having a question of faith that they weren't having before. Think about the ways that all of these aspects might be impacting their suffering and not just their physical experience. I think that's a great question. Thanks. I'm going to um, see there's one more question maybe we can get to um, I think would be good, especially while Dr. Megan is here. Um, how are we providing psychological and social support for children aged 10 and below? Megan, did you want to connect on? Definitely. I can speak to that. So it's challenging and it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can explain today. Um, so we usually start by teaching about how to just provide general support. And then we tend to have enough, we kind of need another session to fully explain how to support children. Um, but I would say the general principles are that we really need to um, engage with the child at their level. So sit down, ask them their name, tell them who you are, what's your name, what's your role, because they don't know much about healthcare, right? So I usually sit on the bed or crouch beside the bed and say, hi, 
this is who I am, this is how I'm going to help you, and, and making that eye contact and really engaging. And sometimes the child doesn't make eye contact at first and engage with you, and that's okay, but it's, it's coming back the next day and again saying, some, you know, trying to engage again. And sometimes for children, they're very much used to healthcare providers not engaging and like talking above their heads. And so it takes them a few times to really recognize it. Oh, this person's different. This person actually wants to know about me. And, you know, for kids, it's like asking them, oh, what is this toy you have? I really like it. Tell me, you know, what does it do? If you see something that they're playing with, you know, play is a really important language that children use to communicate. So in going into play shows them that you like care about the things they care about. So that can be a way to start to build a relationship. And, and that's the foundation of supporting children is making a relationship with them so that then they trust you and they will talk to you a little bit. And then very slowly, they might start to tell you what are their questions and what are their worries. You know, after maybe two or three days on rounds, you come and you say, how are you feeling today? And maybe they actually will tell you a little bit. And if they see that you listen and you try and give them good answers and that you really are interested in them, then they start to really open up and we'll talk about more how we can support them in that way. And somebody's saying, asking for permission to sit on the bed, definitely, you know, that's their place and it can be really a safe place for them and they may not be ready to let you be there. So, you know, starting by maybe just bending down and being beside the bed, but at their eye level and then saying, can I sit? Can I sit here? You know, is that okay for you? Um, as you start to get to know them. So that's a, those are some first steps that will help you build your relationship with children. And I think Thank one you. of the take home points with, with children is very similar to the, uh, another question that was asked I saw earlier, which is what if people don't feel like talking about their situation or their illness, right? They're overwhelmed, I saw by negative thoughts, but for whatever reason, people don't feel like talking. And that is often the case with children, you know, the first time you see them for sure, exactly as Dr. Megan said. And, and one of the core things that we can do is to keep showing up. And that's true with adults too, right? That's true with adults and, and kids to keep showing up and to show that we um, are open to learning about what's important to them. Um, and I think that that's, that's the core intervention for someone who might not be talking to you as an adult as well. Thank you. So um, um, these are great questions and great comments. Thank you all for, for your participation and dialogue. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and move over to Ann Kellerman, uh, who will share a case. Ann, I'll let you introduce yourself and take it from here. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see everyone and, and be here today. Um, I think I might need, I was gonna share my screen for my slides, but don't think it's allowing me to do that. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Can you see that okay? And you can hear me okay? All right. So before we get through this, um, before we start on the case presentation, and, and thank you, Dr. Jesse, for, for kind of setting this up to walk through how we might use some of the things that you discussed in your presentation. Um, I'm Ann Kellerman. I'm a palliative care social worker in Washington, DC. And one of the things, um, kind of some key questions to think about as we go through this case presentation is not only sort of what might you explore about the patient's emotions, but what emotions are you experiencing? It's important to be aware of our own stuff that might be coming up when we're sitting with patients um, and families. And then how can you help manage all of the suffering? And maybe some ways, to, and these are some things to think about as we go through. So the details, this is a 32-year-old female with a diagnosis of um, cervical cancer with METS, having severe abdominal pain and back pain. Pain is um, eight or nine out of 10. Her last bowel movement was about 10 days ago and severe um, nausea, severe vomiting and nausea. So I just wanted to make some notes of these symptoms because really when we're talking about exploring psychosocial and spiritual distress, it's often really hard to have a conversation with a patient or a family or their family about what they're worried about if there's severe pain or if somebody hasn't had a bowel movement in the last 10 days or 
are actively having a lot of nausea. So for a first step would be managing those symptoms. And I know we've had previous discussions over the last couple of weeks on how best to manage symptoms. So in a first visit, and this is another way of building trust with a patient, once you're able to manage those symptoms, then you can return on um, you know, follow-up visits or maybe the next day when those symptoms are better managed to learn more about family dynamics. So the psychosocial and family concerns. So she has a four-year-old son who cries a lot and is often anxious. Husband who is not with her at the hospital because he is working. The grandmother is taking care of the four-year-old son. Her brother is a support and stays with her in the hospital. After the symptoms are better managed, she becomes restless and is crying and screaming out. And during a visit, she sort of is crying and screaming and asks, why me? Why is God doing this to me and to my family? And as you're sitting with a patient, another concern that comes up is she says that, you know, I'm scared to die. So I'm wondering if we could just maybe put in the chat and, and Dr. Hunter, if you could just read out, I'm just wondering some thoughts of maybe, you know, let's look at the first question, the second question sort of, you know, why me or why is God doing this to me and my family? What, what might you do or, or how might you help with explore these concerns? And you can just put your questions in the chat or feel free to unmute. I think you could, I might first start by normalizing the question, why me? That's often very common for somebody who has an advanced cancer and just normalizing how that can be very common to feel that way. You know, why is, why is this happening to you? Um, you can also seek either somebody from her own spiritual community, or if you have a chaplain or a spiritual care provider within your clinic to also come either join in your visit or visit the patient separately to further explore around, you know, the question around why God is doing this to me. And I, I put up some sort of further ways, you know, I, I'm scared to die. So really trying to understand that statement and some of the, you, you could even just say, well, tell me more. Sometimes people are worried that there might be a lot of suffering at the end or worried that they might be in a lot of physical pain. So exploring, you know, as you look ahead to the next days and re weeks, what are you most worried about? She may be worried about her son who will care for her son. There might be some ways to reassure about um, ways that we could better manage pain and symptoms if the scared about dying comes from scared about being in pain. Are there any questions in the chat or any thoughts about what else we might explore with these statements? And there are a couple of comments in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. Okay. Re yeah, reassure her that it's normal. Great. Usually when I hear comments, yep, I think that's good. Somebody mentioned about taking a chaplain with them and just reassuring that, you know, focusing on symptom management first. And then really identifying what emotions might be coming up for you. If you're feeling anxious or sad, um, really being able to identify that, being able to sit with her, asking permission, would it be okay if I just sat with you for a few minutes? Would it be okay if I held your hand? And just your presence is very important. And knowing that you may not be able to get to all of these questions or these concerns on one visit but really focusing on building that trust and, and returning. 
So after the first visit at the hospital, she was informed about her prognosis and they were informed about the lack of treatment options in the camp. She wants to reduce the suffering that she's feeling. And how might you further explore? Um, I think this is where we get into what Dr. Jesse was talking about as you know, total suffering or total pain. So really exploring more. And when she talks about wanting to reduce the suffering, you can ask, well, tell me more. What would be most helpful to focus on today? It can often be overwhelming to focus on um, you know, the total pain or the total suffering. And maybe first wanting to explore the physical aspects of pain or wanting to connect with a chaplain to further explore the spiritual distress that she's experiencing. I'm just gonna look in the chat for a minute because I see some great questions coming in here. So somebody asked around, um, she could be blaming herself. Reassure her that you're gonna give pain management, great. Exploring faith and if faith is a um, source of support. And I like this last question, ask how, how you feel. Most yes, hello, everybody, yeah. Yes, I'm Cora Olan Abdumar. Yes, did you have a question? Go ahead. I think you just got muted, but if you have a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. I like what Susan put in the chat, just asking what makes you feel most comfortable? What would help you feel heard or seen? Those are great questions. And I think as far as, um, wondering, you know, if somebody had put in the chat about maybe she is blaming herself. I think you're able to be, without asking that question directly, you can ask questions about what are you worried about? What are you hoping for? When she's asking questions around why, why, why me? Really normalizing that rather than sort of asking a direct question around if she's, um, if she's um, really blaming herself. I'm just going to look at the rest of the questions. Yeah, and I see the there's a question. There's a hand raised. Okay. Agabakias. I don't know if. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. I was just reading the uh, last couple of things that came in the chat. I don't know if somebody had a question that they want to unmute, unmute themselves. And great. So the next question of, you know, what helps you cope? That's another great question. So just kind of a summary. Um, the patient was well a year ago um, after the diagnosis. She did surgery but could not complete further treatments due to lack of access. And she's receiving palliative care for pain and nausea and vomiting. And with this severe, with this spiritual concern, she did receive counseling um, from the team and from a spiritual care provider. And so I'm wondering if there's kind of any, as we wrap up the case here, if there's any final questions, I might just stop screen sharing so I can see everybody and better see the chat as we talk through more of some of the questions. I think you could also use the HOPE assessment that Dr. Jesse shared to explore her further explore her faith if you don't have access to a chaplain. You also, and I'll put this in the chat, um, you could also use another uh, spiritual assessment that is pretty easy is the acronym is FICA. So it's faith, importance, community, and how you would address in care. 
So you would explore if someone has a specific faith tradition, explore the importance of their faith. And that can be done by asking a question of what gives you strength or what helps you cope. The community, whether or not they have a local community that would be able to come to the clinic. And then how, how they would best want that addressed in their care. Would they appreciate visits from a chaplain? Would they appreciate prayer? And I'll go ahead and I'll put that in the chat. And if people have any other questions, they can unmute or um, put anything in the chat. Thank you, Anne. Yes, we have time for more discussion and comments. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to talk, talk or, um, or type it in the chat. So that, that's a good question. Will she be able to see her, her children, a four-year-old son? And there may be ways to explore, would you like him to be able to come to the hospital? Um, if that isn't possible, if, you're, um, if, if young children are not allowed in, into the hospital, there may even be ways to use technology to bring her son either in with a phone call or with some video technology or ways to explore getting her home so she could be with her family if that's what she's hoping for. And great, so besides just the patient, we also need to look at the whole family system and really how we could get support for um, the grandmother that is caring for the son. Maybe there's ways to reach out and have a discussion with the grandmother about what she's worried about, what she's hoping for, and figure out how to best support her. And yes, I see that Susan put in the chat that if you don't have access to spiritual support, you can always um, ask how they'd like to be prayed for or spoken about and explore their beliefs. I also think you could even, um, if, if the child is able to come to the hospital, you could, you could also meet both with the grandmother and the child. You could figure out um, what helps the child cope. Yes, and also um, exploring with, with her husband. He's not currently at the hospital, but maybe ways to reach out. to include the whole family. These are, this is a great discussion and these are all, all really great suggestions. I think after she dies, you could also um, figure out how to connect the family to support if for grief counseling. These are great, uh, great questions and comments, and it's really um, reminding me how much the work that we do is very family-centered, not just patient-centered. And I really like the way that uh, participants are pointing out how, as a, as palliative care providers, as a palliative care team, while we may 
mostly focus on the patient, we, we must not forget all the family members that are involved, both those who are present at the bedside, who are able to be at the hospital or at the bedside, and those who are not because they're um, either not able to or they're doing other things that are important for the family unit. So I really, I really like seeing that and hearing that. I think one thing that um, I heard Anne talk about that also reflected something that Dr. Jesse pointed out is how important it is as palliative care providers, while we're doing this very important work with psychosocial assessment and spiritual assessment, and we're being present in all of that distress, that it is so important at the same time to practice developing an awareness of how we feel ourselves. Um, because these, these experiences are very powerful. And sometimes we may really relate on a personal level to the patient or to the family, or we may feel overwhelmed with our own emotions about the suffering that is in front of us. And um, and I definitely wanted to remember that myself when I hear what we're talking about today and encourage everybody to, you know, when, when you are in, in these experiences uh, with, with patients and families or right after these experiences to take a moment um, and, and be aware of, of how you're feeling because uh, it, will, it will affect the interactions that you're having with, with them and with other people. And maybe that's something that can happen in those moments of silence that we were talking about earlier, that uh, while, while we're practicing silence and we're practicing being present and not necessarily in for every moment needing to speak or do something, that that's a really good time to, to take your own um, inventory and, and think about how you feel in this moment. I think that your experience and the care you provide will be richer because of that. Doctor, is it okay if I offer up a prompt for people to type in? Of course. I'm wondering if everyone can put into the chat one case they remember of some type of suffering that felt really challenging or impossible to fix. Thanks, I'll type that in. And I'll share for me one that I that I think about a lot was was a young woman who got COVID and while she was pregnant and lost her her baby was she had an urgent C section and was in the ICU herself and had the baby on a camera in the NICU and then lost that baby. Um, and I found that to be a suffering that I found very challenging and really didn't feel like there was a way to fix that. So, and there's a comment about uh, about the patient case while people are. Yeah, I was just reading that. Yeah, if she's very close, I think that that's great. If she's very close to the end, you know, you could explore um, who are important people to be here with you. Are there any spiritual or religious rituals or traditions that are important to you to have before you die? And maybe even exploring her preferred place of death, if she would prefer to be at home or within or at the hospital.
And I see there's some examples coming in of what Dr. Jesse asked people to share. And I would say any case you thought was hard, it's probably a case for which there was challenging suffering. So type in any case you thought was really hard for you. I see someone sharing about a, a, a teenage girl, 15 year old girl, um, surgery becoming impossible and, and asking a really hard question over and over again about why they couldn't take out the mass. Oh, she died today. I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. It's like a hard case. And I see Gabriella sharing the patient who's angry, angry at her own family member. Um, and where you see family members, you know, potentially not supporting um, each other the way that you would like. That could be a really hard thing to watch um, and to sit with. I had a, a wise mentor once tell me that, you know, families had the dynamics they had long before I showed up to care for a patient who might be dying and that um, it's impossible um, and also not our roles to fix all the inter interpersonal challenges that may exist in family members certainly to think about what we can do to help support but a lot of things are pre-existing um, but that can be really really hard to sit with I see parents losing their three-year-old daughter special needs and really a, an, a, a rapid change and hearing you highlight there for a young a young child being completely fine and then going into um, in a cardiac arrest at home. Just the complete unpreparedness and devastation of it. And a, a, a patient, HIV patient at the end of life who is really aggressive and violent and withdrawn and a lot of spiritual support and needed, it seems like. That's amazing you were able to help support spiritually. Lydia sharing uh, someone who had a lot of infertility, grief, um, and having a living child with leukemia. I think sometimes I, I certainly feel, and, you know, to reflect Hunter and Anne's thoughts about thinking about how things make us feel, I often feel this incredible deep sense of like, this is so unfair, you know? Um, and I think it's important to, to acknowledge those feelings in ourselves and to also recognize that's something patients feel a lot too. Another provider, you know, watching a colleague and, and provider losing um, his youngest son, born in your department due to COVID. All sorts of griefs unrelated to death, even a 16 year old boy, you know, losing his vision and having to share, having to share bad, bad news that his vision will come back. These are, these are really incredible um, examples, everyone. And I would argue all things to, there's all of these have embedded support systems that you guys you know tapped into and thought about and I suspect all of these probably require some amount of sitting with suffering that we can't fix too. These are really important um, experiences that people are sharing. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for uh, sharing these experiences. I know that um, we're probably getting close to the end of our time today. Um, and so I wanted to just invite people one more time if there are any other questions or comments for Dr. Jesse or for Anne about the content that we've talked about today. Um, give a, a moment for that.
And for folks, there are a couple of folks who put your hands up. You feel free to unmute and, and speak if you want to. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this lesson. I have a question. Um, when I have a family that I'm um, helping with the patient who is going to die and the patient die, is, is, that, is that okay that I, I have to join the family in the view? You know, when they, when they are with the, the patient who died and they are viewing him, is that okay if they invite me? Or is it better to be away for a little time? I think that's a great question. Are you talking about sort of immediately after the death when like- Yes, hello. Um, yes, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, the thing is like when a patient, when the patient die, uh, usually what I do is I call the family to see how they feel. And uh, sometimes, well, I think most of the time they invite me to the view. So I just wanna make, I just wanna, May be sure if it's okay to join them, like all that process, or they need a time to be just in the with the family. What it's okay, or like sometimes happened to me too that um, the family uh, when the patient died, the family decided to not to talk. You know, they they get mad. You know, all the emotions that they have through the through this painful time, and uh, but I keep in touch with them, like you said in the, in the, um, in the lesson, and they start talking to me again. So my, my question in this, in this case is, should I be with them during the view if they invite me or they need a space? I think it's probably, you know, and I'd be curious what other faculty thinks, but it was probably different for each family. And I think depending on your relationship, you can always ask, is it okay if I join you for a few minutes? Would it be helpful if I joined you and then follow their lead? And then if, you know, other family is also showing up for that, you can, and you know, you can always say like, I'm going to give you a few minutes to be alone, but I'm very close by and you can ask the nurse or whatever your setting is, you know, to come and get me if you have any other questions. Does that answer your question? I don't yes. know if anybody else has other thoughts, yeah. It's okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I just wanted to Great say to you, you know, one, that if you're having patients and families who are asking for your presence, that just to see that's a real testament to the role that you've played in their lives, that that's a, I think that's a sign that they are really grateful for the support you're sharing and to, to let the patients and families be your guide um, if, if people are, inviting you to be present or asking you to, that that's okay. You know, um, I think I just, I'm hearing you say you're worried about it. And I would say, you know, if people are asking for that, that's, that's, oh, that's perfectly okay to do that. Um, and also you can always ask, you can always ask where they're at. And then also just to recognize for yourself that that may or may not be a thing that you want to do at all points in time and to, to think about how you feel in that situation that that's okay too. If there's moments where it is harder or you feel like you, would um, that they that they need time that that's okay to listen to kind of your gut too um, and everyone's different I think it's exactly right some people are really really wanting that um, some people are not thank you great thank you um, well uh, hopefully this has been a rich session for for everyone today thank you for joining uh, we have a session next week that will be on end, very end of life issues and nursing care in palliative care. So I hope that you are able to join. Uh, should be a, another rich discussion. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you wanted to uh, comment on the quiz at the end, uh, uh, at the end of the sessions as well, or I can I can kind of start that off if you want. Yeah, I just wanted to announce, uh, sorry, the kids are with me today, um, but I just wanted to announce that we will be having uh, end of session quizzes for anyone that missed a, a call. So I know that, of course, a weekly call for 11 weeks is sometimes hard to be at every single one or things come up at work, um, which is totally fine. But we will be uh, sharing a link next week uh, in which you can participate and uh, achieve the completion certificate at the end of the course by, by completing the quiz. So if you miss a session, we would strongly encourage you to listen to the recording of the teaching, and then you can complete the quiz, and then we will be able to count that as your attendance. 
Uh, so I'll explain a little bit more next week when we uh, share the, the link, but just so you're aware that you can still uh, achieve the completion certificate uh, through that way as well for any session you miss. But thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jesse and Dr. Hunter and Anne. It's, it's really great uh, to have these sessions, and thanks for all the participants. Thanks, all. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks Bye, a everyone. lot. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you a lot. Well, it was a good session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Goodbye. Yeah.